Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us uh, today. My name is Lee Williamson. I'm the president of the FCC. The 66 articles in the Beijing imposed national security law have touched perhaps every facet of Hong Kong public life. In the three years since the law came into effect, which criminalizes subversion, secession, collusion with foreign forces, and terrorist acts, more than 250 people have been arrested for alleged national security offenses. Over civil, 60 civil society groups have disbanded, and sweeping electoral overhauls on national security grounds have reshaped the city's politics. Critics say Hong Kong's national security law has been used as a tool to quash any and all dissent in the city, while proponents say it's brought much needed peace and stability. In this panel, we will discuss the effect of the NSL on Hong Kong law, politics, and society over the last three years, and what we can expect in the next three. <clears throat> to do this, I'm joined by, furthest from me, Professor John Burns, an honorary professor of politics and public administration at the University of Hong Kong, where he has taught for more than 40 years. Professor Burns' research focuses on the politics and public administration of China, including Hong Kong. Next to him, Professor Albert Chen, who is Chair of Constitutional Law at, Hong Kong Uni at the University of Hong Kong. He, previously served, he was previously served as a member of the Hong Kong Basic Law Committee of the National People's Congress Standing Committee and is currently a member of the National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. Next to Albert is FCC member Emily Lau. Emily was a member of the Hong Kong Legislative Council from 91 to 97 and again from 98 to 2016, the first woman directly elected to LegCo. She was also chairperson of the Democratic Party from 2012 to 2016. Finally, sat next to me is Ronnie Tong, who is a senior counsel, a non-official member of the Executive Council, and a convener of the think tank Path of Democracy. He is a former member of LegCo, a former chairman of the Hong Kong Bar Association, and has also served as deputy judge of the High Court. Thank you, all four of you, for joining us today. My first question pertains to the 47 Democrats and is for all of you. In 2020, 47 pro-democracy politicians held an internal primary campaign to find the strongest candidates for the purpose of winning a majority in LegCo. They have been charged with violating the national security law and are currently standing trial. Can you explain to me why their actions were not democratic, but were in fact a threat to the city's, the country's national security? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, it's very difficult for me to answer this question because uh, there's a lawyer in me, I've been a lawyer for half a century, and I can give you a legal answer but I don't think people are interested in the legal answer because your, your question, uh, with respect, is not quite right. It is not because they, they want to have an internal election to get the best people get elected that they got arrested. It was because that they signed a pact which uh, <coughs> suggested or, or they wanted to overthrow the government by abusing the powers of LegCo, and therefore fall foul of one of the offenses under the national security law. Now, if you ask me, if it is simply a matter of by-election, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, when they started off, people asked me and say, you know, what do you think Ronnie Tong? And I said, there's nothing wrong with it. Even now, I think the, the defendants were quoting what I said at, tri at trial. They said, oh, Ronnie Tong said it was all right. But I was speaking simply from a legal point of view. And I look at all the facts and not just some of the facts. Your question is only based on some of the facts and you ignore the more important fact, which is agreeing to do an unlawful act by law to overthrow the government by whatever means. And they all sign a pact to do that. Now, politically, I agree, the optics is terrible. It really is terrible. I mean, you know, look, I, I brought along with me this whole bunch, you know, bunch of paper. These are um, National Security Act, 
which UK just passed last week, Telecommunications Security Act 2022, Investment National Security Act 2022, Online Safety Bill, which Parliament is currently being scrutinized. And by God, they are very draconian. But, but when I went on the internet and searched, there was no discussion about it. Nobody you know, criticized the UK government. In fact, I think 75% of the UK people supported these legislations. But when it comes to Hong Kong, the sky falls down. I will certainly be asking questions about Hong Kong's national security law compared to other jurisdictions. Do any of the panelists want to add anything to Wani Tong's comments? Well, today, my dear friends, is the 91st day of the trial. I, I skipped it this morning to get ready to come here. And some of them have pleaded guilty, but there are 16 who pleaded not guilty. And uh, those, some of them did not sign any pact as Ronnie has alleged. Anyway, you are a lawyer, you are a lawyer. I don't think we want to commit any subjudice thing. But the fact is, many of those people have been locked up for two and a half years or more. None of them have been found guilty. Or you may say some have pleaded guilty, but not yet, you know, there's no judgment, no sentencing. So I, I just find it very, very disturbing, Professor, that in Hong Kong we have common law, people are presumed innocent before they are found guilty, and then they are denied bail. In this hot weather, you are sitting out there, I feel sorry for you guys, that's why I asked them to turn on the aircon, full blast, and give you some fans. But in prison, they have none of that. It's so it's a question of humane treatment. It's not luxury if we have air cons in the prison. I, I, I so, Ronnie, I, I did not interrupt you when you spoke. I, I thought you were so Lee, I have not finished. You can see I'm on full flight. How can I be finished? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so anyway, so the thing is, the trial, I don't know how many more days, weeks, months it's going to take, but it has sent short waves throughout Hong Kong. That's why Ronnie said civil society has more or less collapsed. The FCC abandoned the Human Rights Award. Many uh, news uh, organizations have collapsed. There are journalists in jail, vegetating now, stiff no bail. And also, other NGOs have fled from Hong Kong in the last few years. I think we're talking about immigration rate of more than 300,000 of professionals and others. Lee, okay, I'll give the others a chance. Can but I, not Ronnie, I, I, because the others have not opened their mouths. I'm going to move on to another question, because I think we could take a full hour on this question alone. <laughs> so uh, we will come back to all of these points and more, I think, over the course of our discussion. Um, Albert Chen, earlier this month, just to move on slightly, Hong Kong police issued arrest warrants and million Hong Kong dollar bounties for eight self-exiled activists accused of NSL offenses. The warrant highlights Article 37 and Article 38 of the security law its extraterritorial application. What are the chances that these warrants will lead to the arrests of these suspects? Well, um, as, as you may know, uh, before the 2019 uh, anti-extradition movement, um, Hong Kong had uh, entered into more than 30 extradition treaties with various countries, including the UK and, and the US. Uh, and uh, many uh, Western countries. So, so at that time, um, for uh, offenses which uh, are technically in law subject to extradition, uh, there has been extradition of what we call in law fugitive offenders. Uh, as between Hong Kong and the US, Hong Kong and, 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 and other countries. And there were cases in which uh, extradition actually took place uh, as between Hong Kong and the US. Um, so extradition, uh, for the purpose of the layman, is applicable where, say, um, A has committed an offense uh, in, in uh, one country, say uh, X, and then uh, A um, uh, goes to another country, uh, Y, and uh, country X requests the extradition. Uh, 
uh, of uh, this person A from country Y to country X. So, so this kind of warrant which you just mentioned uh, will only um, work if there is extradition as between Hong Kong and uh, the place where these, these people uh, are, are, are located. But as you know, um, after 2020, most of these Western countries which have extradition arrangements with Hong Kong have already um, uh, cancelled, uh, uh, abolished the extradition arrangements. But even if there were extradition arrangements, uh, I think as, as Ronnie Tong has pointed out in 2019 during the extradition bill <laughs> controversy, uh, political offences are not subject to extradition. So, so even if we, Hong Kong has an extradition treaty with, with a, a particular state, uh, and uh, one of these people subject to warrant uh, is in that state, extradition may still not work uh, you know, on the ground that uh, it is a political offence uh, that, that is concerned. Sorry, John, I will come to you, but, um, but Albert raised something that I, I want to throw to Ronnie Tong now about extradition treaties. <coughs> Ronnie, the eight fugitives are based in the UK, the US and Australia. The governments of all three countries have decried the warrants, criticising the extraterritorial application of the NSL. With extradition not an option, what would you say is the end game behind the arrests over the last few days of some of the eight activists, family members, who are still in Hong Kong? But before I do that, I need to uh, uh, answer Emily's question because I think we're wrong to left that accusation left unanswered. National security offenses are very serious offenses. In many countries, the penalty is death. In UK, it's life. US is life. It's a serious offense. And very much so as rape, murder, robbery. Have you ever heard of a suspected rapist, suspected murderer, suspected robber got bail? Have you ever heard that? It's just that people, because when it comes to politics, people tend to wear colored glasses to look at the situation. They don't, they don't look at the legal aspect. As, as I say, the, the lawyer in me tend to tell people from a lawyer's point of view. But there is some truth in what I said. I think if you think about it, it is extremely unfortunate that these people got locked up. I agree. Yeah. You know, I, I hope that most of them would get bail. But I trust that our judiciary, that they would deal with it you know, on the evidence they have in front of the court to decide who stands a high risk. Coming back to your question, there's nothing you can do about it. But as I say, Criminal uh, uh, national security offences are serious offences. It would be wrong, even from a political point of view, to left these uh, uh, offences unattended, as if that nobody cares about it. So long as you have left the country, that's all right. Now, if you look at the uh, National Security Act of the UK, if you look at it is uh, very clearly stipulated that the offense has got extraterritorial effect, no matter where you went. Doesn't matter what passport you hold. There is actually a case where an American holding a uh, British passport was convicted for uh, treason against Her Majesty the Queen uh, when he did something in, in Paris. Can you imagine that? So um, it is for the dignity of national security that they got prosecuted and they're wanted by the courts. But there is a, 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 a side issue. It is suspected, no doubt by the law enforcement agencies, that they don't operate alone. They operate because uh, some of the offenses deal with you know, foreign uh, 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 political powers. So it will, be, it will be necessary, first of all, to indict them uh, in order to carry on investigation in relation to other people connected with uh, what these people do. But at the end of the day, things would have to be sorted out, uh, you know, by our courts. John Burns, speak to uh, you. Uh, that? Yes, yes. Um, I have to declare my position first. Th th that is that the law, we've, so far this entire discussion has been focused on the law. The law is part of a package, and the package, you outlined it at the beginning, is a political package. It's not primarily a legal package. 
That's the first thing. And the second thing is, from my perspective, the law represents and protects the interests of the people in power. So this is, this is when we're looking at this, I think we have to look at it from this particular perspective. And then we, um, if you ask the question about the extradition of these eight, I mean, this is a warning, a messaging to people that might support them, including foreign politicians and all these sorts of people who will put more people on sanctions lists and this kind of thing. So I think it's political messaging. All of these things that we have been talking about have a political component to them. And yes, I agree that national security is an important matter. I agree that uh, national security law must be obeyed and all this kind of thing, but it exists in this kind of a context. The authorities have been trying desperately to change our political system, to change the way people in Hong Kong think about these things, to change our attitudes, to change our behavior. These are long-term kinds of goals, and they're doing it first with these laws. A question for uh, John Burns and also Albert Chen um, about Article 23. Of course, Article 23 of the Basic Law puts a constitutional obligation on the Hong Kong government to enact local legislation that prohibits acts of treason, secession, sedition, and subversion, something the Hong Kong government has thus far not been able to accomplish to date. John Lee, a chief executive, has announced that he expects Article 23 to be enacted by the end of this year or the beginning of next year at the latest. Given some of the perceived ambiguity, which you just spoke about, John Burns, of the national security law and what conduct is and isn't covered within its so-called red lines, can we expect the enactment of Article 23 to bring some clarity there? Clarity is one issue. Actually, the issue that I'm most concerned about is stability. We, you know, and so we have Article 23 being enacted. Um, of course, we have a requirement in the basic law to do this. The central government has permitted previous governments not to do this. Apparently, they no longer uh, uh, permit the local government not to do this. I expect there will be clarity, but there will be an expansion of what national security means. This is in keeping with the security environment on the mainland. It's in keeping with the security, in the geopolitical security environment that we find ourselves in. So I think, uh, but the reason I raise the issue of stability, I perceive, and others have said this, Xia Balong, for example, that Hong Kong is not stable. And it's not stable precisely because hundreds of thousands of people in Hong Kong who have supported um, more accountable government, more participation in these kinds of things, have been disenfranchised through these new arrangements. They're still here. They haven't emigrated. And so, so Article 23, I don't think is going to address that issue. Uh, Albert Chen, yes. John Burns just mentioned an expansion of what national security law means. Um, Article 23 um, stipulates that Hong Kong shall act its own laws to prohibit, in fact, seven types of offenses, treason being one, secession, sedition, subversion against the central government, also theft of state secrets, foreign bodies conducting political activities in the city, and local bodies establishing ties with foreign bodies. The basic law, as you know better than most, was drafted in the 80s and 90s. In 2023's political climate, what organizations could potentially de be deemed a foreign body in Hong Kong under the drafting of this law? Uh, for first, maybe I'll explain that um, some of the matters covered by Article 23 uh, have already been dealt with in the uh, national security law. So, uh, as you, you, you mentioned, Article 23 deals with seven matters which are supposed to be prohibited by Hong Kong local law. Uh, but among these seven matters, two matters have now been uh, regulated or, 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 or dealt with by the national security law, namely 
subversion and uh, secession. So the, the new IDO 23 law will have to deal with the, the remaining matters, the five other matters, but among these five other matters, um, most of them are already partially dealt with by existing law. For example, the crimes ordinance, a colonial law already uh, uh, provides for the offence of treason, uh, and there's an official secrets ordinance which uh, provides for protection of state secrets, which is one of the seven matters in Article 23. And we also have uh, sedition in the crimes ordinance, uh, which actually has been used to prosecute um, uh, more than 30 or 40 people uh, in the last uh, four years, uh, la la last two years. Uh, so, so I think the Article 23 exercise is mainly uh, an exercise in um, amending the existing law. For example, you mentioned for, uh, foreign political organizations. Now, now, not all foreign organizations are targeted by Article 23, but only foreign political organizations. They are su not supposed to engage in political activities in Hong Kong, and they are not supposed to have ties with local political organizations. Now, to some extent, this provision has been implemented by our society's ordinance uh, when, uh, when it was amended in 1997. So, so I think the government will only need to f review these provisions and see whether they need, uh, they, they need to be improved. Uh, I, I think even IDO 23 you know, deals with foreign political organizations. The extent to which IDO 23 or, or the new law under IDO 23 uh, regulates them uh, is probably less than what is being regulated under the UK Act, which uh, Ronnie has just mentioned, the new UK National Security Act of 2003 um, has very extensive provisions aimed at uh, foreign interference uh, in the UK. So uh, what would exactly, just the, the kind of, the, the takeaway, what would be defined as a foreign body? It must be a foreign political body. Yes, yes, that is Article 23. Article 23 mentions expressly foreign political bodies, and not all foreign bodies are covered, yeah. Um, Emily Lau, as a former journalist, a former chair of the Hong Kong Journalists Association, um, I want to ask a question to you and also broadly to the rest of the panel later about freedom of the press and also the, the glory to Hong Kong protest anthem. Our members at the SEC welcomed last week's news that the Department of Justice had informed the court that it agreed to an HKJA proposal to include an exemption for journalistic activity in coverage of the protest anthem, Glory to Hong Kong, if its injunction application is to be granted. Is this a clear sign from the government that under the NSL, the media can objectively report sensitive topics and law breaking without fear of repercussions? Well, I shouldn't think so. I woke up this morning and I heard on the radio news, uh, the Secretary for Security, Mr. Chris Pang, speaking, uh, I'm sorry he's not here with us today, and he's talking, he's aiming at what we call Yun Doi Kong, soft resistance. He said, must tackle that. I don't know <laughs> whether you people know what is soft resistance. <laughs> and, and he actually named the news media and also people in arts and culture as maybe some of the culprits who are may be guilty of soft resistance. I don't know what is the definition of soft, I don't know whether FCC by hosting <laughs> these things is soft resistance. But I saw an article in the South China Morning Post last week about uh, the yellow uh, restaurants, yellow shops. They are all very quiet because they are regarded as soft resistance. So, so if Mr. Tang mentioned the news media this morning. You, I think the uh, interview was in Sing Tao. They call it the unofficial gazette. <laughs> so you can read that. And so I don't think any journalist, including yourself, Lee, <laughs> should feel that you're safe. But I, I think we, we just need to continue to fight for space so that journalists and others can operate, and lawyers and so on. Because this is the Hong Kong that we all knew and loved. And we don't want it to just sink to the bottom of the Victoria Harbor. And I want to tell Ronnie that although uh, national security offense is very serious, but there are some who have been given bail. Ronnie, as you know, 
and others not given back. So even those of the 47 and one who pleaded guilty has, has got bail. So, uh, well, anyway, I, I, I am very worried. And you know, press freedom, our ranking, not too many years ago, global ranking was 2020. Now, it's about 150. <laughs> so as the previous president of your club said, it's fallen off a cliff <laughs> from 20 to 150. That's, that's the state of affairs. You can tell us how you think, really, <laughs> although you're the moderator, but you should know. I'm the moderator, but I'll direct people to our recent press freedom survey, which is available in the Correspondent magazine. John Burns, you intimated you wanted to respond. Yes, yes, I completely agree with what Emily said, and I think this needs to be looked at very seriously. Soft resistance against anti-China seditious elements in education, the media, culture, and ideology. This is very vague and does not tell us exactly what the authorities are thinking. So this goes way beyond the narrow discussion of the law that we have been having here so far. And I'm unaware, you know, that these things have been codified in the law. So this is a worrying development for many in Hong Kong, I would say. It's almost as if the government is saying, you know, the word patriot is code for you agree with us. If you agree with us, then okay. Um, then you can be in the district council, you can be in LegCo, you can be in the election committee and all these things. Um, but if you don't agree with us, well, then you're resisting or you know, and hard resistance, soft resistance, I'm unclear what it means. Ronnie Tong. Can, can, uh, I, can I come in? Yeah, please, let me ask you a question <laughs> just, just about points, that. Uh, let I, let, I let me ask you a question exactly about that. <laughs> Article 4 of the NSL enshrines Hong Kong's freedom of speech, the press, of publication, and so on. Um, what uh, Ronnie and John are talking about are issues, for example, earlier this month, the Leisure and Culture Services Department encouraged Hong Kongers to report library books that may be in violation of the NSL. Um, how does that square with Article well, 4 of the NSL? Uh, as I said, I, mean, I need to pick up some of the points. And, uh, I understand where John is coming from, but uh, national security laws are not about protecting people in power. <laughs> Law is to protect the constitutional order, the nation, not the people representing the nation. If there is no nation, there is nothing else. There is no politics, there is no democracy to talk about. So, so uh, let's get this clear. Secondly, uh, if you ever had a chance to look at the national security law on the mainland, put it on the table, compare it with the national security law we hear, you will see they're vastly different. They're vastly different because of the one country, two systems. All right? Now, coming back to your question, there is no conflict, there shouldn't be any conflict between press freedom and national security because the two never meet. They never overlap. There is no such thing as a gray area. If you look at Article 19 of the ICCPR, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, which some say is the Human Rights Charter, it makes it very plain that when it comes to national security, it is reasonable to limit the right of expression, which includes uh, press freedom, to reasonable bounds. Now, the question is, what is the reasonable boundary? That is for our courts to decide. I hope people will agree that we have a very independent judiciary, which is well-renowned. And so far, I have not seen any judges who behave badly as if he's in the pocket of Beijing. And, you know, I've never seen that. I mean, I see people getting acquitted. Uh, I see people uh, getting bail, all because of different considerations. As a lawyer, I, I, what I can say is that not every case is the same. People need to look at each individual case and think about the different facts you know, associated with that particular case. Now, some people get bail because the risk of they offending the law may be very low or that they don't have, uh, there are no suspicions of they getting into contact with other people 
or might offend the law. It may be that. I don't know. I can't speak for each and every case. And I'm certainly not here to defend the government. I'm here as, as me, me finish, my individual, right? And I just have to say that I have very strong faith in the one country, two systems. I have very strong faith in the independence of our judiciary. I know all these guys who are now sitting in the high court, in the court of you know, final appeal, all my life. I don't believe any of them are corrupt. If you, if you suspect any of them are corrupt, let me know. And I, I'll try to do I, something about I, it. I, I Emily, just, now you I indicate just, you want to respond, no. then I'm going to go to Albert. I just want to add that uh, we talk about 270 people who have been arrested so far on NFL charges. And for the 70 odd who have been uh, tried in court, all of them have been found guilty. As the Secretary for Security said or boasted, it's a 100% conviction rate. It's not something that we are, <laughs> you know, we, we, we associate with Hong Kong in the past. So I'm not casting aspersion on anybody, but that is the thing. 100% conviction rate let, for those who have been tried. Let's let just do some fact check. No, it is not correct. The majority of those defendants are not being prosecuted under the national security law. They were being prosecuted for various political offenses, which has always been the law, part of the law of Hong Kong. But I believe it is about 200 plus under national security law mm. charges or yeah. yeah. charges. I think, I think we can check oh, afterwards I'm because sure. those words came from the mouth of government yeah, officials. Yeah. Chris Tang, I also did also both about the 100% um, uh, conviction record. That yeah, is absolutely, yeah. um, I, I saw that myself, that yeah. is absolutely <laughs> Albert Chen, I want to ask you a, uh, a direct question uh, about freedom of the press before we move on. Can a Hong Kong-based journalist interview and quote one of the eight self-exiled NSL suspects without fear of themselves violating the national security law? Um, I think, as far as I know, um, it depends on what is being quoted uh, uh, as regards what they, they say in the interview. Uh, I think, as far as I know, there's no general exemption or immunity for, for uh, journalists uh, 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 doing reporting uh, on political opinion or, or speeches. Uh, correct me if, if I'm wrong. Uh, so, so if somebody um, you know, who is being interviewed says something which constitutes uh, an offense under the national security law, then any, um, any um, transmission uh, of, of what is being said may also, um, may also be a breach of the law. So it depends on the context uh, and, and exactly, uh, and also on the con, con, content, yeah, the context and the content of uh, what is being reported. Uh, but I believe that as far as the national security law is concerned, the offenses are quite narrowly defined as compared with the other law, which I think, uh, is it, is it, uh, yeah, yeah, Ronnie, because you mentioned that, that some of the 70 people were not convicted for an offense under the NSL. Uh, in fact, some I'm of them speaking. were convicted for sedition. Now, that mm. is uh, separate from the NSL. Sedition is in the crimes ordinance, uh, and the coverage is broader than the NSL offenses. So what I said, uh, namely that uh, the NSL offenses are relatively narrowly defined, applies only to the four kinds of offenses under the yeah. NSL namely uh, secession, subversion, uh, terrorism. Uh, terrorism and collusion with foreign forces to endanger national security. So if what is being reported uh, of what these people say does not uh, fall into any of these four types of offenses under the NSL, then it should be fine. So, so I think we, we should all have a careful look. National security law police. Pardon? Sedition arrests are usually made by national security police. A sedition, police, right? uh, they are in fact, uh, among the people who were being prosecuted, so far 160 people were prosecuted uh, for so-called national security offences. So, um, so among them, most of them were prosecuted for offences under the NSL, one of, 
I mean, one of the four kinds of offences I mentioned. But some of them, I think maybe one third uh, or so, uh, one third or one fourth, were prosecuted for sedition, which is a colonial law in the crimes ordinance. And in my view, it, 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 is, it has a broader coverage than the NSL in terms of it criminalizes speech that uh, incites uh, hatred uh, against the government right. or the judiciary. Stan uses charge. It, it may be very confusing, but when people talk about national security laws, they are talking about national security laws in small letters, not in capital letters. <laughs> right. All right, in capital letter, as uh, uh, Albert said, we're talking about that law which has been uh, enacted by the People's Congress Standing Committee. John, you mentioned, um, sorry, you intimated a couple times you wanted to, to, to say something. Let me also ask you a question, if you can answer at the same time, please. So Ronnie Tong has mentioned a few times the international context and Hong Kong's national security law compared to other jurisdictions. Of course, most, if not all, jurisdictions have their own laws pertaining to national security. Hong Kong and Beijing state that the West is hypocritical in criticizing Hong Kong's NSL. The West but cries false equivalency. Who is correct? So, if, yes, I, I completely agree. Every state needs to pro does protect itself with some kind of national security law. I think the question is, how is it interpreted? How... I mean, we have a situation in Hong Kong where exactly the same words, freedom of this, freedom of that, appear in the mainland constitution and in our basic law and in the UN Convention, the Convention on Human Rights. But they mean totally different things. This is a very serious problem. And so in other states, you have... You have um, you have broader discretion given to civil society to exercise these rights than we have, appear to have, in Hong Kong now. We used to have, but appear to have. One thing I wanted to say is we've been talking about the limited impact of the NSL all capital letters. And I've been referring to the NSL regime in small small letters. But the point is, the NSL, the law itself, is being used by authorities to intimidate. And, and this is widespread. This is what Chris Tang is, specializes in. And so, oh no, we're not going to charge you with, we haven't charged you with any NSL, but be very careful. You know, you're in danger of uh, committing some national security law violation. So these this kind of intimidation, it's designed to encourage people to self-censorship, to self-censor in the media and everywhere else, and of course to change their behavior. I, I just want yeah, to add, go ahead. we have the book fair going on now, and they interview some of the publishers, and the publishers have almost no political books, or if there are very few, are, are available. And he said they used to talk about self-censorship amongst the journalists. But this publisher said self-censorship among all the Hong Kong people. Now, apart from soft resistance, which I just referred to, if you look at Article 29 of the NSL about collusion with foreign country, and subsection 5 said, by provoking, provoking by unlawful means hatred among Hong Kong residents towards the CPG or the Hong Kong government, which is likely to cause serious consequences. What is it that is to provoke hatred? So that's what John's talking about. You have free speech. Now maybe it's going to criminalize free speech. So this is now in the NSL and it's in a section under foreign country. But maybe Chris Tang and others are thinking of, you know, putting it together with soft resistance in other laws. So, Ronnie, I hope you understand. You may not agree, but I hope you understand the concern, not just of journalists, but many people in this room who are professionals, who are academics, and others. You know, I, I, what is I understand provoking the hatred? Ronnie, if I criticize I, the let, government, is it provoking hatred? I, I, let, let me ask a question I, that I, Ronnie can just, respond I to I think there. we have to deal with this because, I mean, this gets very confusing to the uninitiated. You know, I understand the concern, but the section that Emily read out already existed 
since time immemorial in our laws. It was enacted by the colonial government. Mm -hmm. Under the crimes ordinance, it's the same the concept. Country, and you cannot promote right. hatred okay. between Name different country. groups of people in Hong Kong. So it's not new, it's not because of NSL. It has always been. And if you look at the National Security Act of the UK, you see that they have exactly the same kind of concept there. I agree, when it comes to politics, people get excited. You know, people have their own views. And this is, you know, the most difficult part of what we're dealing with in Hong Kong. It's all a matter of perception, and we are losing the perception more. I agree. The government should do more, to explain more, to let people understand what actually is going on, and not let uh, rumors pile on rumors and, you know, misconceptions pile on misconceptions and think that, you know, Hong Kong is no more because of NSL. You mentioned a couple of times your faith in the judiciary and the independence of the judiciary. Um, Emily Lai mentioned uh, Chris Tang, security secretary, who, who, who mentioned the 100% conviction rate. In addition, uh, national security cases are presided over by hand-picked judges, uh, often in non-jury trials, as is the case with the 47. Democrats and, and foreign lawyers can't represent defendants in NSL uh, after Beijing overruled Hong Kong's highest court. Some people see that as uh, evidence that Hong Kong doesn't have as independent a judiciary as it once did. Tell them why they're wrong. Well, uh, uh, again, your question is not right, factually. <laughs> uh, you know, in so. every legal system, uh, judges are being uh, appointed to deal with particular kind of cases. In Hong Kong, we have cases that deal with family uh, disputes, judges who deal with commercial disputes, and they're being appointed by the uh, CJ to do that. The, the national security law judges are exactly the same. They rotate, they're being appointed by the CJ. If you, just let me ask you this question. Do you really think the chief executive knows every judge? No, he doesn't, or she doesn't. You know, when I'm talking about uh, you know, our, 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 our last uh, chief executive, they have to call up the CJ and ask, would you recommend who to sit on the panel? And the CJ would say, well, well, A, B, or C can sit this year. Next year will be B, E, F. But there has to be some specialization of judges to deal with the kind of specialized cases. And that's why you have judges who are designated to deal with this kind of, 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 of uh, cases. And it's the same the world over. It's the same in Singapore, same in US, same in UK. You don't get you know, a family judge to deal with national security cases. It just doesn't happen. So um, there's a lot of questions I didn't get a chance to ask. Maybe Sorry, them, yeah, do, Elvin, do you want to go Elvin ahead? My, my advice, advice, if you ask Elvin a simple one point question instead of stating your views behind before you, 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 you read out the question. And that's not right. Because some of the things you, you put up, you regard it as background, is not factually correct. And I, I certainly disagree I with some background. of the background that you did. I was asking you, know, you to prove why, why that was incorrect. And, uh, and I, you know, if you ask me one question and I simply answer that question, it seems that I'm, I'm endorsing what you're saying. <laughs> No, no, before no, you all. put the question, I was that's not uh, fair, giving some it? background and asking for you to, to no, either refute no or answer. agree. It's not fair. But no I, I want to bring in Albert, as I'm afraid Albert. I haven't been able to bring him in for a while. You, you might, please. Um. Oh, I just want to, to um, explain that Ronnie said that Emily w is referring to a colonial law, but actually Emily was referring to Article 29 of the no, NSL. I'm, I'm saying that the same kind of provisions already, already existed. Let, let, let Albert finish let, point, let, let Okay, finish. so yes, the same kind of provision existed in the colonial law, but that, that provision is actually uh, very wide uh, and um, may, may need to be you know, revealed or, 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 or interpreted by the higher courts. But still, uh, actually, still if you remember, more. 203, uh, the 203 bill uh, to implement Article 23 actually proposed to, to reform significantly, this law of sedition. I'm, I'm advocating it should be repealed and redone, you know, and according with modern times. But until that is done, the law is the law. We're running short on time, so I'm gonna move to questions from the floor. Um, we probably won't get time to uh, get to everybody's question. Uh, I will ask you to keep your questions short, and I'll ask you to keep your questions to questions, not statements.
Um, <laughs> and uh, please do uh, identify yourself before you ask your question, and if you work for a media outlet, uh, who you're affiliated with. Um, do I see a hand? The gentleman over there, please wait for the microphone. I'm Jaden Chung, a mentee of Ms. Emily Lau. Before I ask my question to Mr. Wong Ni Tong, I would like to express my gratitude to the FCC and be free of the guest speakers Three. for providing us <laughs> a, with an intriguing talk. Mr. Tong, Hong Kong is now in a politically sensitive moment. I'm interested in politics and journalism. Could you please tell me or teach me how to express my own comments on go governmental policy safely, safely without seeing the so-called red line? Well, I, I would simply say that, you know, rest assured that uh, you can say anything you like in Hong Kong. You write to SCMB, write to Meng Bao, or any newspaper, and I've been doing that every day of my life, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, I still strongly believe in our legal system. Nobody can get convicted unless it can be proved that they have criminal intent. So if you're simply expressing an opinion, whether you're a journalist or not, I can't, for the life of me, think that you could be convicted. Because, uh, you know, in order to uh, uh, infer criminal intent, and because criminal intent is not written on your, on your face, and, you know, it's not something concrete you could put in your pocket. But the judges would have to infer your intent from the surrounding circumstances, from things happening around you, what you said, how you, what you di did uh, uh, before. But you know, if you believe in your own innocence and be confident about yourself, I don't think you should exercise self-censorship. Ah, uh, but SCMP and Ming Bao do. Yeah. So you send it to them, they won't publish it. Yeah, True. I, I've written, uh, you know, articles to Financial Times and, you know, The Guardian, and they refuse to pin my article. <laughs> they censor you. Okay, huh? same so, thing. You've been you self-censored too. Let, let them ask a question. What other questions do we have from the floor? The gentleman over there. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And a very uh, august panel. I'm, I'm very impressed with the FCC for putting on the, uh, today's event. And I have so many questions, I don't know where to start. Uh, because I <laughs> Start with the first, please. Yeah. We want to get to some other people. <laughs> okay, I understand. Start by introducing yourself, Richard, please. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, I'm Mike <laughs> Rouse. I'm a resident for 50 years and a naturalized Chinese citizen <laughs> since 2001. Um, so I've... In our family photo, I am the Chinese member, okay. even though appearances may be otherwise. Um, I want to know why the CE is involved in setting up a list of judges. Why not leave it to the CJ? I want to know uh, why there's a presumption against uh, bail. In fact, judges make these decisions every day according to the seriousness of the offense and the strength of the evidence and so on. But I guess my question, because you only allow me one, is for the moderator. I believe you introduced one part by saying that the relatives of the eight were being arrested. I don't think they are. They're being questioned. I don't think any of them are on bail. They've been apologies, released. in which case, if I said that I misspoke. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, uh, Albert, would you care to respond to any of those other questions which you did bring up? Why designated judges? Is it in the law? Okay. Yes, yes. Um, uh, these are actually the, um, the more controversial features of the national security law. Um, designated judges, so, uh, so not every judge is qualified uh, to hear national security cases under this law. Only ju judges who who are in a list of so-called designated judges uh, are qualified to hear such cases. Uh, the list is actually um, uh, uh, the list consists of judges designated by the chief justice. Sorry, ju designated by the chief executive after consultation with the chief justice and the uh, National Security Committee uh, of the Hong Kong government. So as far as I understand, the, the purpose of this provision is to ensure that um, 
that the judges who hear national security cases uh, um, are, um, are judges who have the relevant expertise and also who um, support the values and, and the policy behind the national security uh, uh, law. Uh, so even foreign judges, even judges of foreign nationality are not uh, automatically excluded uh, from being designated judges. But I think it is recognized by the, 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 the makers of the national security law that maybe because the national security law is politically controversial, uh, not all judges in Hong Kong may, may identify with uh, the, the values uh, behind the national security law. Uh, that is my own, <laughs> my own reading. <laughs> <laughs> They're not patriots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as go ahead, go ahead, John. There is a political reason for this, and that is to ensure that authority can politically vet the judges. So this is, if you, if you uh, give this authority to the CE, then you are giving this to other political authorities. Now, as far as bail is concerned, this is again very controversial. Now, under the existing law, um, the judge can deny bail to to uh, to an offend, uh, to a uh, suspect on the ground that he or she may abscond if if granted bail, or he or, may, he or she may interfere with witnesses, uh, and on the ground that he or she may commit another offense if granted bail. So these are the three grounds for denying bail under the existing law. The national security law um, uh, adds a, a fourth uh, dimension, which is that it says that unless the judge is satisfied that uh, this person, uh, if granted bail, will not uh, commit a national security offense, uh, then uh, the judge may grant bail to this person. So the Court of Final Appeal has actually um, interpreted this provision. So basically what it says is that this provision uh, introduces the highest threshold for getting bail, but it doesn't mean that a defendant cannot get bail. So, so actually, as been pointed out by the speakers, other speakers, a number of these defendants, maybe I think, uh, maybe uh, one third or more of the defendants of national security cases have been granted bail, and, and the others have not succeeded in getting it. Thank you for the question, sir, and pardon me for me speaking. You're absolutely right. The individuals were questioned. Their, in some cases, their, their properties were searched and, and their personal electronic devices were also seized and searched, but you're absolutely correct. Um, There's question? a question Another here, question? The, lady. the lady. Let's go over there and then over there. That may be all we have time for. Thank you all for speaking. Sorry, we can't hear you. Hello? Yeah. Thank <laughs> you all for speaking. Uh, my name is Kari with Bloomberg. Uh, I wanted to ask on the government's uh, indictment to ban the 2019 <coughs> protest song, Glory to Hong Kong. And I'm wondering what is the legal impact of setting a precedent to ban a song by using um, the judiciary? And what are the impacts on free speech and ramifications for tech companies in the cities moving forward? Do you have a particular panelist to question this too? No, but no. Professor Chen. Oh, okay. Um, no, the, the, the application for the injunction uh, to uh, prohibit the uh, broadcast of, of the song is based on uh, the view expressed in some court judgments that this song, this uh, Glory to Hong Kong protest song, uh, actually uh, uh, contains content that violates the national security law, particularly the uh, succession uh, uh, the, the anti-secession provision. So, so this song is understood, at least according to these judgments, as promoting Hong Kong independence. Uh, so, so I think the government uh, is uh, just um, trying to, to um, further implement uh, what the court said uh, in these judgments regarding, so regarding a song by, um, prohib by getting injunction to prohib prohibit its circulation. Uh, I, I also heard that, um, that uh, Google and related companies um, were not willing voluntarily to, uh, to, to uh, how do we say, to, 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 take, to, it, take to, it down, to take, take it down, 
unless there is a, 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 a unless they are legally are compelled to do so. So maybe that's the reason why the government wants to to create a legal basis for uh, requiring Google to or YouTube to put it down. I don't know. Maybe running your more can inside I information. The song is not banned. Otherwise, you don't need an injunction, right? Uh, what is being done is that the uh, authority wanted to prevent people from making use of the song in order to advocate separatism in Hong Kong. If you look at the terms of the injunction, that's what it says, right? The song is a dead thing, it's not human, right? It can't commit an offense. It is how you make use of the song that, that may, you know, cause uh, uh, the law being infringed. One thing about this whole thing which intrigued me a lot, because it started off with all these international sporting events, and mm -hmm. Hong Kong won, so they want to play the anthem. And I think most of the organizers, they don't have time to you know, do it. They go to Google <laughs> to find it. And then what did they do? They typed out Hong Kong anthem. <laughs> I, ca I can't understand why they would do that. Because this is supposed to be a Chinese anthem. There's no such thing as Hong Kong anthem. Exactly. But it's these international sporting organizations that they should go after because they think Hong Kong is an, a separate entity from the PRC. So that's how it got started. You know? So they say, oh, you must go and find the organizer, give them the USB, and you must play this right thing. And the people say, I'm very busy. I have no time to entertain you. So what happened if you win? I'll go to Google again and type Hong Kong Anthem, and they get that thing again. So the problem is not solved, even if they get it done here in court, because in all these venues overseas, they still type Hong Kong Anthem. I don't know why they do that. Good luck educating these overseas bodies. Whenever I use my Hong Kong ID to buy wine abroad, often they tell me how much they love Japan. Um, <laughs> so best of luck with that education. There was a, a one final question over here. Hi, um, this is Enid Cho, arts editor of the South China Morning Post. So um, naturally, I'm very concerned about Chris Tang's comment on soft resistance. My <laughs> question perhaps would be best directed at Professor Burns or Professor Chen. Um, if they if somebody like Chris Tang wants to find <laughs> extra sort of legal tools within the current national security law regime to do that, what would be available to the administration? Extra legal. <laughs> I mean, Come on. intimidation in my view, this is, this and self-censorship. This is exactly what the game is all about. And this is, it's very this is successful. Nice. Nah. <laughs> well, Professor Chang, we'll just direct it towards you. Uh, well, I, I don't know how soft uh, resistance is to be defined, um, but from the legal point of view, we, we, we believe, I mean, most people who, who, who study law in Hong Kong uh, believe that uh, the law should only um, target activities which are clearly um, against the public interest, uh, I mean the, the criminal law. So, so if there's so-called soft resistance which, which is objectionable, objectionable from the government, government's point of view, the government can use its own uh, machinery to <laughs> promote the right values, the right attitudes, as, as John says. Uh, and I think the general, general legal principle is that we, we should not use the criminal law to, to prohibit um, speech or, or, or thinking, uh, which the authorities simply dislike. Uh, I think every law student, I don't know, even, even in, the, in your days, we studied J.S. Mills on liberty. And I think uh, his passage, his views about liberty are even quoted in constitutional law textbooks uh, in the PLC today. In fact, I, I, I just wrote a foreword for a, a mainland scholar uh, uh, who, who wrote such a text <laughs> and quoting J.S. Mill on liberty. So I, soft I, resistance, I mean, so, so my own view is that the government should use, um, choose its, its own means to counteract what it considers to be the wrong view of history or, 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 or of China or whatever. Uh, instead of using the law to do so. Before Ronnie opens his mouth, I just want to add, to remind everybody, I think it was his 
chief executive who said that even if you haven't broken the law, you may be damaging national security. So people say, what the hell's going on? So maybe, I, I guess you remember John Lee saying that, so well, you can answer all of that in, in one go, Ronnie. I, I think I can now open my mouth. Yes, you can. <laughs> I, th I think it's very dangerous to uh, confuse uh, law with politics. Um, Chris Tang may be the ex -co police commissioner, but he's now a political official of the government. And he was, I think, talking about politics, not law. Uh, as far as I know, and I know I'm a lawyer, uh, I don't think there is an offense called soft resistance. Uh, <laughs> you know, there is no such thing. Uh, you can, you would, as I say, I, I, I strongly believe in our system. You would only be convicted if you have a criminal intent to infringe the law. And there is no law here. It is politics talking. He was just saying that, you know, don't make trouble and, and Politicians do that. I mean, you know, they do that everywhere. You, you know, and they talk about things which, you know, a normal person may think is nonsense. <laughs> no, no one is confusing law and politics. I mean, they're looking at the political context of the law. This debate could run on and on, um, and I would love to let it too, but people have uh, jobs to get back to. Um, but I want to uh, finish things up by saying sincerely thank you to all for of our panelists, John Burns, Albert Chen, Emily Lau, and of course, Ronnie Tong as well. Please join me in thanking them with a round of applause. Thank you.